I was going to ask how many people have never been to Boston. So many of you have. You know we have a great legacy transit system. It is a great legacy transit system. Unfortunately, uh, it's a legacy transit system, so that means it's aging. And uh, if you follow the news, if you're not from Boston, in 2015, we had an unusually harsh uh, New England-Boston winter. And one of the outcomes of that uh, Mother Nature experience was a, basically many elements of the system broke down. It was a meltdown. And it was a wake-up call to many of us uh, in the region. And we've tried not to be beaten down by that. We tried to actually use that as an important opportunity to think about resilience and to recover and restore this great mobility asset that we've enjoyed for well over a century. So partly what I hope we can do today is share some of the experience of moving from calamity to innovation in a very short period of time through the exercise of focused leadership on behalf of both the public agencies, the municipalities, and the, the transit advocates who are critical to making the whole system work. So let me begin by asking each of our panelists to introduce themselves to you, and then we can uh, have a, an int hopefully interesting dialogue. Joe? Good afternoon. My name is Joe Aiello. I'm a partner at Meridian Infrastructure, which is an equity firm that invests in public-private partnerships. But I'm here primarily in my other non but non-paying role, which is chairman of the MBTA Board of Directors. Joe? Good afternoon. I'm uh, Joe Barr. I'm the director of uh, traffic, parking, and transportation uh, for the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts. We, we have a competition going for longest agency name, and we're definitely in the lead on that one. Um, so we are responsible for the operation of Cambridge's streets, traffic signals, signs, parking regulations, enforcement. So um, when it comes to transit, we are both a very, very engaged stakeholder and have been working very closely with the T on a variety of issues. But in terms of the bus system, we're the right of way for the buses. So as we think about the opportunities to improve bus service, you know, the partnership between us and the T and other municipalities is, is really critical to making that happen. So I'm David Blockchachter. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at the T. So and I'm also a Cambridge resident. So I, in some ways, have two bosses up here with me. Um, and, well, you're my boss. Oh, I guess yeah. That's that's true. Um, and 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 so my focus really is on uh, initiatives that are touching the customer. So you know we've got a lot going on. Um, and what we've done, I think, rather uniquely at the T, is sort of carved off the technology role to focus um, specifically on things that affect the customer experience, whether they're fare collection, whether it's you know, the systems that run our buses and, and trains and the public information around that. And that, that's my role. Thanks, guys. So one of the great things, I, I have been coming to Meeting of the Minds for several years, and one of the great things about it is that it enables, I have found, it enables people to really share and learn in a way that is unique. And so um, I know we've learned a lot uh, yesterday and today, and I'm hoping that you will we can share some of our recent experience with you. And I want to talk about a couple of things. I'd like to talk about capacity building at the MBTA, uh, meaning resources, and how that helps you transition to an innovation culture. The second topic being culture, change, risk taking. And, and the third topic being collaboration, uh, which all of these things are happening. I mean, they happened before. 2015, but they're happening, I think, today in a much more focused and strategic way. So maybe I'll start with Joe Aiello and ask you, as the chairman of the Fiscal Management and Control Board, how do, you, how do you see your role coming in from a very challenging time to managing through that and now um, having innovation and risk taking become one of the emerging hallmarks of the current system? Okay, thanks, Jim. Um, it might be uh, helpful to spend a few minutes on, on sort of what we inherited when we came in in um, July of 2015, right after the snowstorm that melted down the system. Um, we had three key stakeholders, none of whom had any confidence in us. Uh, the first were those who subsidized mass transportation, whether it's the taxpayer or the legislator's perspective. Um, the T had been slipping in performance and its operating subsidies had been climbing dramatically over the last number of years. Um, and there was a real 
sense of loss of confidence. Should we break up the T? Should we disband it? Should we privatize it? Etc. So that was an important constituency we had to deal with. Obviously, with a malfunctioning transit authority, you had very unhappy customers. Um, and the third but more troubling aspect was we had a very dispirited workforce. And um, it was deeper than um, so sort of one would typically imagine when lo one looked at the history just before we got there. In the last seven years, the Transit Authority had been led by five different general managers. So the staff was, and, and I would add on top of it, the legislature had reformed the governance of the T three times in a period of 12 years. So if you're a typical employee at the T, we show up you know, with this great title, Fiscal Management Control Board. They don't differentiate us on day one from the last set of folks who came in and said things are going to now be different. Um, and failing that every reform had failed them as employees and that they were not being treated properly, a very real cultural problem. So we had to attract, uh, attack, um, we had to attack all three constituencies. We had to find a way of bringing our spending under control. We had to find a way of getting some immediate improvement in performance. And we had to work with the staff to say to them, we know you're very, very capable. We want you to come to us with your best ideas uh, because we're, we're a board. We're not transit professionals. And it will be our job to help sort through the kind of ideas that you all have and try to prioritize them and find the dollars to be able to implement on them. So that was the, the, the basic framework. And if I could for one more second, it, it, was, it took about four or five months uh, to get uh, two things to happen. The second is going to be getting to sort of David and the automated fare collection system investment program that he's been running. Um, we, had had a, uh, we had had a program that had started actually when, when Jim was secretary to replace all of the vehicles on our two lines. What we found was that the uh, system, which was running at about 85% on time performance with six minute headways, um, hadn't thought about the fact that Boston was in a boom period in the last decade, that ridership was growing, crowding was becoming unacceptable. And we needed to not just replace the cars, we needed to promise a new operating process uh, for the citizens. You heard the, the gentleman from MIT complaining about the red line being unreliable. That's his experience. That's a real representation of what the, the customers are looking at. We told the, the, the staff, think about the red line a little bit differently. They came back and said, here's what we'd like to propose. We're not just going to have new cars on the line, but we want to go from six-minute headways to three-minute headways, and we want to go from mid 80s on time performance to 96 plus on, uh, percent on time performance, passenger weighted. In order to do that, we needed a investment in power, because you're running more trains, in the signals, because you're running them closer together. All in all, we're going to double our spending, but this is what we can do with respect to throughput. We saw that idea, loved that idea, rewarded that idea by reprogram uh, capital budget to be able to support that. Right behind it, uh, David had been leading a set of folks who were thinking about the next generation of fair technology. And he came forward to us with a wonderful proposition, which is the data we were missing to be able to make better uh, decisions, the, the ability to differentiate about among customers, which we cannot do today, so that we could provide discounts for those who might be on AFDC or other kinds of uh, programs so that they could afford to go look for a job, could afford to get to the doctors when they were unemployed, et cetera. And a wide variety of other outcomes were possible if we could get uh, an investment in, in the AFC 2.0. Um, it was staff-driven ideas. We held a competition around those ideas that really emanated in us uh, leading to the AFC program that we have uh, undertaken. And one of the things I would say leading to the, the um, collaborative nature of this uh, discussion. Um, we also understood that David and the staff were going to have to get the buy-in from the City of Cambridge, City of Boston, City of Somerville, and some of our other municipal stakeholders 
And so on top of being a technically complex endeavor, it was going to be a complicated collaborative endeavor in an environment where we did not exude um, confidence of a partner who could deliver on what they said they were going to do. So sorry for the long-winded answer, but well, no, it's, I'm going to set the, it's good. the high um, bar that David was giving. So I want to talk to David and Joe both about Joe Barr. About a, for those of you who don't like like myself hate acronyms, it's automated fare collection, and it assumes there's been 1.1 to 1.9 before it, but there probably hasn't been. But <laughs> AFC 2.0 is something that I think um, will reflect a lot of what people riders are hoping to see happen over the next several years. For example, all door boarding and more efficient ways. Of the Bar Foundation that's been so generous to many Bostonians. Uh, in terms of its commitment to not just the, to this event, but to what we do in Boston, very interested in bus rapid transit and the kinds of fare collection techniques that you need to have in order to make these things possible. David, explain to us a little bit about um, the innovation, and the thinking behind AFC 2.0, and then segue to Joe Barr about how municipalities have to be collaborating and responding uh, as we move forward in this. So I mean I think you know the automated fare collection I think we've we've heard a lot and we've we've seen a variety of systems whether you've been in London or whether you've been in Chicago uh, or you know Philadelphia a number of other places where you know there's a relatively standard set of what you want to do with fare collection now you want to make sure that you're building off of you know um, open payments um, you know so that you can accept credit cards and Apple Pay Samsung Pay all of your wallets natively uh, you want to make sure that you are. Um, you know, you're, you're issuing your, your own fare card in some way because you have to deal with the issue of the unbanked and the underbanked and you have to make sure that, you know, people who are still in the cash economy, whether by choice or because they have to be, um, are, are, still, are still served. And, and, and we're doing all of those things. You want to make sure that it's an account-based system so that you can set policy by software rather than set policy by hardware. And, and, and that's relatively, in some ways, standard issue for the generation of systems that we're dealing with. What, what we're trying to do in Boston, I think, is, is unique in, in two ways. Um, the, the first way is that we're trying very hard to embed policy in the technology decisions immediately. So uh, from the outset and, and working very closely uh, with the board uh, and with a lot of the municipalities uh, surrounding uh, uh, Boston, we've got a lot of municipalities, so we, we get to be very collaborative. Um, so one, one of the things that, that, that we went off um, first was to decide that we were going to go to a system that was no longer going to accept cash on board our buses or our light rail vehicles. Um, so we're not putting things like fare boxes on vehicles. And, and we made that decision um, not because uh, we hate cash and we think that cash is evil. In fact, we think that cash is a very important part and we spend a lot of time on that. Uh, we're doing it because we know and we've seen um, throughout the world and in, you know, in, in San Francisco and in other cities in the U.S. that if you go towards all-door boarding, you can significantly improve the service um, that you can offer citizens. Now, what that means when you do that is that all of a sudden you have to start building infrastructure off buses. You have to take uh, advantage of your physical infrastructure if you still want to make sure that you are serving the unbanked and the underbanked. Um, and, and so we're making a, a very significant investment there. But so that's about embedding uh, policy within technology. The other thing, and, and this comes out of the experience of the winter of 2015 and the uncertainty that Joe talked about in terms of um, the number of general managers and, and the amount of leadership change and the, the, the various different um, uh, regimes that we've gone under um, in terms of what the structure of the T is overall over the course of the last decade or so, is that we wanted to uh, embed the delivery method of the project uh, a little bit differently. Now, I know it's very exciting at 4 p.m. On, on the last day of a conference, what you really want to hear uh, people talk about is exciting procurement delivery methods. Um, <laughs> but, but I'm very excited by this, so I'm going to talk about it anyway, and I'm on stage. Uh, so This so, is as excited uh, as he gets, by the yeah. way. Yeah. So the, the, so, so what we're doing is, is sort of the first in the nation is, is a public-private partnership. Um, and this has been uh, a, a big uh, delivery challenge. And the reason that we're doing it isn't because of 
the financing hurdles. It's because we truly believe that this is the way that over the course of a long-term partnership, we begin to align the incentives between the public and the private sector, between our delivery partner, so that we get a system that is not just delivered quickly, but we get a system that is functional and is able to meet the needs of our customers for the next decade or two decades. It's a long-term contract. Um, and furthermore, that it allows us to set the terms of ensuring what the technology can do rather than um, trying to keep up with the technology piece by piece. And one of the challenges in the public sector is the needed reinvestment and the needed constant reinvestment and the challenge is always going to be to settle for just good enough or for the lowest common denominator. Whereas if we bake that into the public-private partnership at the outset, it allows us to ensure that we're able to really meet our customer needs over the course of the next couple of decades and we can we can, we can bake that in, we can solidify that right now. Turning sort of back over into the, the, the community portion thereof, <coughs> uh, uh, you know, one of the big pieces that we have to do bec um, because we're removing cash from onboard vehicles um, is that we have to begin to think about how we put that physical infrastructure in place. So typically in a fair collection system, you have your fair vending machines, ticket vending machines that exist within your stations, and then if you get on the bus, you pay in cash or you get a ticket like that. Once you remove that ability from the bus, all of a sudden you need to find uh, solutions to replace that for the people who are still in the cash economy. Um, and so a lot of what we're talking about there are the typical things like uh, retail networks and going to stores, but in places where people are, in fact, usually the worst off, there is also retail deserts. And so the question is, how do you reach those people? And the, the, the relatively simple answer is, well, you put on-street infrastructure that can accept cash for those people who, who, who need to use it. You hope that you reduce it uh, very significantly. Now, we don't, as, you know, as, as I think is pretty typical, we don't run our streets and we don't own our street infrastructure. We have 175 different municipalities or so that, that run our on-street infrastructure and you know, Cambridge is, is definitely one of them and so a lot of the conversations that, that we need to have are, well, you know, for this big investment that we're making, for this uh, promise that we're making to our customers that we can run buses faster because of fare collection, because the best fare collection gets out of the way and the thing that we're trying to build is something that gets out of the way even more than what we have right now. Well, that does begin to put a little bit of pressure onto the street infrastructure of our partners. Yeah, and I think, you know, for, from our perspective, we're, we're very supportive of doing AFC, so, and I've been through doing um, off-board fare collection for BRT in New York City, and, you know, there's always these complicated coordination issues about where do you put the machines, how do you get power to them, how do you, you know, get snow clearance, all these things, and I think, you know, that's where the trust that you build up over time to be able to work collaboratively on a, on a project like this is, is really important because we work with the T on a regular basis, so it's not like this is the first time the T is coming to us and saying we want to do something in partnership. Um, but even then, you know, there's always, you know, two big agencies or two, you know, biggish agency and a maybe not quite so big agency, there's always diverging uh, goals. So I think, you know, working our way through all that, um, you know, is, is challenging, but we, we, you know, on the operational level, we have to come up with a solution. But I think what really helps also is that, you know, we're in a position where we can, we, we are seeing the T do something as well. So a lot of times when you're doing BRT, you know, the roadway agency often sort of looks around and says, well, I'm doing these bus lanes, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And, and there may or may not be the same level of change coming from the transit agency. So I think in this case, it's very easy to say, well, the, the T is investing, you know, all this money, all this time, all this effort in improving their piece of the puzzle. And we all know that fare collection is, is, a, is a big issue in terms of delay. And so we can say to our constituents, yeah, you might see a fare machine pop up on your street. You know, you might not love that piece, but overall, you know, it's going to make the bus network work so much better in the long run, or hopefully not in the too long run, um, that, you know, it's actually uh, worth it. And I, I think the other third piece is really that, you know, when, when you talk about the way the T's been talking about the sort of social equity issues and the unbanked, you know, that's a big issue for Cambridge. Um, you know, it's a, as you, you may have you know, heard the expression People's Republic of Cambridge, it's a very uh, progressive place. And so making sure that those issues are being addressed is really critical. So the fact that the T is coming to the table with, you know, solutions and ideas about how to solve for some of those issues, I think really helps because we're not in a position where we're questioning, is this the right investment to make, uh, you know, at a, at a sort of broader policy level. Joe Barr, can you just 
quickly, what are the attributes that you, as the sort of chief of transportation in Cambridge, what are you looking for as a partner from the state's transit agency? What are the attributes that you are looking for most and perhaps that have been happening more recently? Yeah, well, I mean, I, you know, obviously there, there's always money. Um, and which you know we can all use, but in fact, in, in it was just earlier this week that the T has um, you know agreed to partner with us financially uh, on doing transit signal priority. And this is again another example of kind of a win-win situation. We get the opportunity; we have some money in it. The T will have some money in it. We get an opportunity to upgrade our signals, provide better communication, uh, and they get an opportunity to make their buses run better, which benefits us as well. So I think you know that that you know the financial piece is important, but I think. You know, really, the, the trust piece is what I guess I, I view the most. And when I worked in New York City, there was always reasons why, um, you know, the New York City DOT and New York City Transit could, they could always find reasons to go back into their corners and not talk to each other. And so the real challenge was maintaining that trust and being able to work together on an ongoing basis. It's, you know, they talk about how it can, you know, you can, you, it takes a lifetime to earn a friendship, but you can destroy it in five seconds. It's the same kind of thing. It's a constant process of, of, as I put it, in a not very inspirational way. It's not about not, it's not about getting to yes, it's about not getting to no, um, and just finding reasons to continue to work together. So I think, you know, developing a, a relationship that's, you know, based on trust, based on experience, uh, is, is to me actually the most uh, critical piece of this. And then also, like I, I sort of alluded to with the equity issues, is really being able to have a discussion about what our values are and how do we jointly achieve our, our goals, because the T's goals and the city's goals, although they overlap in many different ways, and in some cases they, they diverge and we have different stakeholders and we have different you know, things we're trying to accomplish in a global sense, and, so, and we have our own independent political structures, obviously. So figuring out how you kind of keep that moving forward, I think, is in, in a partnership is really the, the most important part of that mm -hmm. relationship. I'm just imagining that inspirational poster that says, not getting to know. Yeah, no, I, not I, getting I, to know. <laughs> Joey Allo, can you talk, now you're chairman of the board. How do you, what are, the, what are the strategies or techniques that you use, what are the approaches that you use to make staff like David and others uh, feel comfortable about taking the risk that is, by definition, inherent in any innovation? Because that's, I've always found that, whether it's public or private sector, human nature, people do not like risk taking, and therefore they're often timid about innovation. That's not really happening now in Boston, but tell me a little bit about leadership from the board, the kind of messages you send, the kind of approaches that you use, and where, where you've gotten those from. Um, I think we were fortunate around this topic to have a project come to an absolute horrible failure point uh, within 60 days of showing up as a board. And that was a proposal to extend the Green Line out to Somerville, otherwise known as the GLX project. It had signed a full funding grant agreement for $2 billion in January of that year. By the time August rolled around, uh, we were told that there was a billion dollar problem. So a 50% increase in cost. When you dug deeper through that, the construction portion of that budget had effectively doubled. And you wonder, so how can this possibly happen over a short period of time? And you discover that the, that the organization had selected a unique delivery method, never been tried before. And we asked the question, so we could have just sort of fight everybody, my God, you know, get, this is horrible, performance, get out of here. But we decided to sort of look at what caused the problem. Um, the organization picked an alternative delivery model um, because it felt that it needed to to attract the FTA money. But when you asked the FTA, they said, no, you had a pretty good ranking. You were going to get the money anyway. You really didn't need to do that. It selected a delivery vehicle of all the alternative delivery systems available that was inappropriate to the job because they didn't understand alternative delivery and they didn't hire the expertise to help them sort through the alternatives. When you looked at the delivery team, the delivery team was four MBTA employees supported by about 100 consultants from four different consulting contracts. One of the staff members said, we have trouble even figuring out how to keep up to pay the invoices. Forget about managing the team. We asked the question, how many of you have been sent to school to learn how to use this particular delivery method? The answer was the goose egg. 
right? A disgraceful that performance. That means none in Boston. Either. That means zero in Boston, right? <laughs> A disgraceful performance by the previous board and management of not investing in staff and telling staff, go ahead and do something that's pretty innovative, right? It's like telling me, go ahead and dig up the sidewalk out there and use a jackhammer for the first time. I guarantee I'll cut off my ankle and probably an innocent pedestrian going by because I don't know how to use the tool. So I think the staff came to great comfort when we said, we're not canceling the project and we're not firing anybody. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna rebuild the team and we're actually gonna send the team to school to train them in, on using alternative delivery methods and we will find the appropriate alternative delivery method to deliver the project. And I think that was the first thing that, to, to, to my extent, be important. I've never had this conversation with David, so he may disagree with me. We're trying to make a statement that we need to invest in you when David came with this idea that I'm worried about the ability of the technology to keep up with the standards as, as innovations are introduced in the fair collection system, as customer expectations change, and that we can have a continuous um, leverage over private sector performance, is something that he had never done. Um, he came to us with a package that said, here are the resources I need internal resources, I need to train people. Here's a recruiting pro program I need to have for folks I need to add to the organization. And here's a consulting framework I need to help it. It was a very, very well thought out effort. We will probably make some mistakes, there's no doubt about it, but I think from a risk management perspective, the T is a much better place than it was before. And we actually now have a, um, an office of risk management where anybody who's doing anything differently can go to them and get advice and help before they get to the board and have a formal risk management approach to some of these very complicated projects. Um, one of the things we really worried ab about and one of the reasons why we're so delighted with David is Boston's a very hot economy, construction, technology, et cetera. How do you recruit in that environment when we're probably paying everybody about 40% of what they could make in the private sector. Thanks for that. <laughs> you know, one of the things about David's group chief technology office, apparently every time I say this, there's a blizzard of comments about wanting a pay raise on social media, but since I've never been on social media, I don't even see it. So, which one of the benefits of being old. Um, uh, so anyway, uh, David's been able to tell a story uh, uh, to the community about how this is gonna be transformative. When the leadership in Cambridge and the leadership in Boston woke up one Sunday morning to hear the mayor talk about he is now going to provide the key to the city, which is going to be this uh, instrument that will allow you to use a taxi cab, a TNC network provider, uh, parking, public parking garages, et cetera. It sounded suspiciously like what David's been doing, so people are taking political credit for it, which is wonderful, and so it did, it did take that kind of leadership from the staff to really go forward. But to answer your question, risk management, risk management, risk management, and allow people to have the platform to take chances. David, what's your perspective on no, the I, other side of this? Yeah, I mean, I think that there is, um, it, it, sounds, it, it sounds like I'm brown nosing a little bit here, um, and, and maybe I am. Um, this but is on there's, video. Yeah, <laughs> but there, there is, um, <coughs> There's a permission structure at the T right now to go out and to be entrepreneurial, to go out and to think about what needs to be done and to go and ask for the money to do it. Um, and so much of what we have to do are these very big things, uh, a green line extension that is in the billions, a red line and orange line cars and new signal systems that are in the billions. Our state of good repair backlog is seven point something billion dollars. There are these very, very large projects. and they need to be managed very closely, and, and so, so do the, the smaller things as well. But there's a, there's a structure that's there right now which says that if you're doing something that helps the customer, you will have an advocate in the board to make sure that that project gets done. You will have an advocate for that money. You'll be held accountable for it, but that you can go out and do it. You can go out and run the project, and you can go out and talk to the people that you need to talk to you know, in the neighboring cities and towns to make sure that this actually takes place. And, and that's something that doesn't exist in a whole lot of public agencies, to my knowledge. And it's attracted, I think, a very different quality of staff there than you know, we've seen in the past. And for the first time in 
something we don't talk a lot uh, about, but for the first time, we're actually beginning to capitalize on what is perhaps Boston's best asset, which is the fact that we have all of those universities around and all of those you know, people who we can attract, and they've never worked at the T in the past. And now they're not just working at the T, but they're running large portions of our revenue and you know, our innovation and, and a whole different piece, you know, whole different pieces of that. And that means that talent can begin to attack, attract talent. So just by giving permission, I think it really changes the, the whole culture. We have a little less than two minutes, so I think it's probably time to wrap this up. I wanted, there was a very interesting comment made by uh, um, a fellow from MIT who said, asked, talking about innovation, we need all the innovation that we should have, not all the innovation we can have. And I think that um, what we're, what you're hearing today and what was trying to be done in, in Greater Boston uh, in our transit system in a new era, I think, of municipal collaboration with state agencies and in a new era where risk taking and innovation is being encouraged um, is to figure out that we can't do everything, but we need to figure out what's achievable and do what's achievable. Sometimes what's achievable may not be what's optimal, but we are taking, I think, the right steps forward in greater Boston to get the job done. It's important stuff. The, the economy of Massachusetts depends enormously on its metropolitan Boston region. 164 communities, MBTA service area 175, pretty much the same footprint. 84% of our state's GDP comes from that region. And it's a highly dependent transit environment. And so what these folks are doing every day um, is really responding to one of the chief engines of our economy and if we succeed, and you'll notice that hopefully over the next several years, it'll be because of the mindset that uh, is being brought in Massachusetts. So thank you all, and um, I hope this was an enjoyable session. Thank you very much. That was